Hey folks, welcome back to another Field and Garden podcast. It is your friend, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and thank you so much for dropping in here. And I do wholeheartedly mean that because we just appreciate all the comments and all the interaction and everything that we're getting on our podcast, and especially on this new series called Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hi, Lane. Hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. So today is kind of a little different twist. And after I run through some little housekeeping stuff, I'm going to let Lane tell you all about what we're talking about today. So friends, if you're not familiar with us, um, this podcast is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com, which is our website that just is full of fun stuff. Everything from the home to our blog and podcast and tons of videos and resources, as well as a large library of online courses and our garden shop where we sell just those few tools and the same seeds um, and supplies that you hear us talk about and all the seeds that we um, talk about you're normally going to be finding over on our store and Lane happens to be our seed manager. And if, you know, there's some seed that you're thinking is not on our website that is a must have, she's the one you need to like push that little envelope to. Yes. And yes. so friends, just check us out over at thegardenersworkshop.com. We invite you to just go over and fall in and um, we're there for you, whether you're a home gardener or a flower farmer. So Lane, tell us about today's podcast. I'm pretty anticipating this, y'all, because I think I have to answer a lot of questions. You do. I hope you're ready. <laughs> so <laughs> Try, and I do have one little note in front of me. She did give me one hint. Yes. One. One. And I've got the answer to that here. So we'll see how I do yep. on this test. Yes. So today is going to be the first episode in a new little mini series we're going to be doing here on Seed Talk from time to time, and I'm calling it How Seeds Changed My Life. And let me just explain to you the concept behind this series of episodes. So if you've listened to past Seed Talk episodes, you might know I'm an avid gardener. I have been seed starting for many years, and I'm also the seed manager, like Lisa said, here at the Gardener's Workshop. So literally every day of my life, is affected in some way by seeds. And I was sitting there surrounded by all these seeds one day when a thought came to my mind that how funny is it that these teeny tiny little things can have such an impact on people's lives and take them in directions that they never knew were possible. And that is how this concept was born. And our very first guest for How Seeds Changed My Life is our own Lisa Mason Ziegler, who I think is the perfect candidate because as we'll learn during the course of this interview, Lisa's farming business was largely based on growing and selling annual crops that she grew from seed. So let me just explain the format of this interview so you kind of know what to expect. So we're first gonna go through some questions about how Lisa got into seed starting and how she got into flower farming and how annual crops really shaped her business. And then we're gonna move into a really fun lightning round, which is gonna be some rapid fire questions that I'm gonna ask Lisa about her favorites and least favorites of various things. So that should be pretty fun. And then we're gonna move into my personal favorite round, which I am calling hypothetical situations. And you'll just have to wait. You'll have to wait to see what that entails. But I will say there may be aliens involved. Okay. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you're just, you're just going to have to wait to find out. Um, so my hope is that over the course of this interview, we are going to have some serious questions. We're going to have some silly questions we're just going to find out more about the seed life of Lisa and her flower farming journey and just get to know more about her in general. So I hope we have a lot of fun in the process. And I also want to say, if you are listening to us over on a podcast app, you should really come join us over on YouTube. I know I'm looking forward to seeing Lisa's reactions when I ask her some of these questions, and I'm sure you are too. So come on over and join us. You can see us talking and having the conversation. And remember to give us a like over there on YouTube if you enjoy it. So what do you say, Lisa? Ready to get I am, started? I am, I am like anxious. 
scared yeah. and totally excited. I love yeah. living on the edge. So this is perfect. Oh, I know you do. I know you do. I always offer to warn her about the questions beforehand. And she says, no, she wants to just do it live for you guys. So let me go ahead and start this slideshow. We will get going here. So are you ready to step back in time, Lisa, into the time machine? Oh my. Okay. Seatbelts on. Right. Seatbelts on. All right. Very first question. What is the first seed you ever started? Which seed Snap starting dragons. methods? I knew you were going to say that. And which seed starting method did you use? And was it a success or a failure? So tell us about what prompted you to start seeds for the first time, what it was, what happened. So I ventured into my very first seed starting failure um, because I was kind of dabbling with thinking about becoming a flower farmer. And I figured I had to grow tons of seedlings. Um, and I kind of bought one of those dome kits down at the local garden center and brought it home and was a total failure out of the gate. I mean, I tell people if there could be a cartoon, I have a, I would have a closet stacked with failure kits <laughs> of different methods of start a home gardener to start seeds. Um, and then I read um, Elliot Coleman's book, The New Organic Grower. And he introduced me not only to soil blocking, but what makes seed starting successful and fail and knowing the rules changed everything for me. Yeah. And so I literally did exactly what he recommended and snapdragons, which was a crop that, cause I was launching my flower farming beginning. I didn't really know it then at the end of summer. So I had to start cool season, hardy annuals and snapdragons were one of the only ones I knew of at that point. And I soil blocked and I snapped, I sowed snapdragons and I literally was an overnight success. And how experienced of a gardener were you at that point? Did you have a lot of experience? Did you have a little experience? I barely, I don't even think <laughs> you could really call me a gardener. Um, I lived in a deep shade home um, and I had bought a few perennials, sun perennials and planted them in the shade um, and didn't have much success. But the little bit of success I did have just really fueled my fire. And then once I had a little bit of success, then I happened upon that book and it just one thing led to another. Yeah. So I was right. barely a novice. <laughs> All right. So let's that kind of ties into my next question, which is what led you to become a flower farmer? So that is so funny. You know, this thinking back business is really pretty interesting. I'm talking about things I haven't yes. thought of in a long time. Um, so I had just, you know, married Steve recently and he was a big gardener. And at the same time, my grandma had had a massive stroke and Tuesdays were my days to go and spend with her. And while I was there, I just was flipping through a magazine and read an article about, it was about Lynn Bozinski, but it recommended this little booklet she had printed and had written before her book, The Flower Farmer. And I wrote off and got, I thought, man, wouldn't that be fun to stay home and grow flowers and actually sell them? You know, I mean, it was dreamland stuff, right? Yeah. But literally that lit me on fire and that started it all. All right. And that also goes into my next question. What did your friends and family think when you told them you wanted to become a flower farmer? So you just said you had some gardening experience, but it wasn't a ton. So what did they think when all of a sudden you announced, I want to become a flower farmer? So it was kind of a little bit of a slow process. You have to know that, you know, when I married Stevie, he came with this great garden and dowry, right? This piece of land. When I say piece of land, I mean, for the we live in the middle of the city. An acre and a quarter was a very large lot in our neighborhood and what was available. Yeah. Well, they had really large vegetable gardens. And so I jumped right in to start working with those. So I slowly started squeaking in more and more flowers. Stevie was 100% like, oh my gosh, that would be so great, you know, for you to work the garden and sell flowers. The rest of the family, we didn't kind of just come right out and say it, it kind of evolved. And they were, they were all surprised as so many people are, they don't even know that that's a thing, right? That you can, oh yeah, that yeah. selling flowers is, you know, an eight 
billion dollar a year industry in the United States alone every year cut flowers not not nursery yep. plants so yeah. they were surprised but they they all came on board you know but they all kind of looked at me over their glasses a little bit at <laughs> first all right so which crops did you think you were going to be focusing on when you started farming and why did you ultimately decide to focus on annuals? So I wanted to ask this question because I think a lot of people wanting to go into farming, they're imagining growing tulips and anemones and lilies and dahlias. And I'm just curious what you thought you were going to be growing and then how you ultimately ended up with the majority being annual crops grown from seed. Sure. And that's just such a great question. So, um, as I mentioned, when I really started to dive into flower farming, it was like August. And, you know, you're all, I had, um, I had read Lynn's book, The Flower Farmer, um, and I was pumped. I was ready to do something to get started. And I didn't really have a lot of um, experience. And I didn't even, her book didn't really, I mean, the information I had didn't really talk about those bulb crops at this point, but it did talk about a few hardy annuals. Um, and they would have been sweet peas, sweet William and snapdragons and rudbeckias. Those were the four first plants that I started from seed and planted in my garden. And um, I was literally like, just like that seed starting thing with Elliot, it's like once you get the right information from the right person, I was an overnight success. I mean, I planted them in the fall and all winter I was looking at those plants thinking for sure they were not going to survive winter, um, but they did survive winter. And I definitely, as I then, you know, next spring, I took my flowers to the florist and one thing led to another. Um, probably after that first year, I started going down that rabbit hole that so many of us do, you know, was like, oh, wow, do you grow tulips? Do you grow lilies? Do you grow this, that, or the other? Um, you know, we'll buy them. And I then started experimenting with a lot of different bulbs. I mean, I could, we could go down a real rabbit hole here, which I won't. I, for about four or five years, went really high in a lot of, you know, lily growing, growing in crates and it there's definitely a market there is def they're definitely gorgeous but they are definitely a high investment high what I call a high investment high risk meaning if you're not really set up to do it there's a lot of ways to lose a good portion of that crop um, and after I did that for a few years I just realized that I never had enough of the annual crops that were so much simpler, which were low investment, I mean, like microscopic investment compared to the bulb crops. Um, and I never had enough to go around. So I literally just kind of stopped growing and growing more annuals. And that started me down more annual variety, cool season, warm season, tying it all together. Um, and Literally, to you know, I mean, that's what I built my business on now is that there are cool season and warm season, and the combination of the two can give you a really long growing season. And we might add in here that I don't have any hoop or greenhouses, so I grow everything outdoors in a giant garden, basically, like you know, same thing home gardeners do, just on a much larger scale. And I just found that it was simpler. It was less stress and it just fit my conditions so well that I just ran with it. Yep. And what percentage of your total sales would you say came from annual crops that you had grown from seed if you had to estimate? Well, so like if I would compare that to our last few years in production, um, like 97 to 98 percent, because literally the only perennials that we had um, were we have a fairly large bed of peonies which are obviously a perennial but tuberoses um, we don't have to dig tuberoses here where I am so they they behave as a perennial um, so really tuberoses and perennial and um, peonies are the only two permanent crops that we have ever sown sold for the last decade um, but they're a very small they are a very small portion of what our business was. Yes. Okay. So how did seed starting in your business evolve over the years? And I'm kind of curious 
how the methods might have evolved, your setup, how many seeds you were starting, and who was starting them. What did your seed starting operation look like at the beginning versus at the end? Sure. So to set the stage, um, I live in a bungalow. Um, it's like 1,100 square feet. And um, I started, I mean, soil blocking played an enormous role in allowing me to pursue becoming a commercial grower because it was just very conducive to the what I had. I didn't have any special space. I didn't have this work building that I'm currently sitting in where, you know, this the home base for everything now. Um, so I literally started out in my kitchen on my kitchen bar and I have a pantry and there was a shelf in there that I put a grow light on and we have a cellar. And when I say it's a cellar, it is a cellar. It is not like a basement. It is concrete. Um, you know, I call it the dungeon. It's just not a place you want to go spend a lot of time. Right. But I was so desperate for space. I started looking into it. Um, so I began on my bar in my kitchen in that um, pantry and then as it evolved, so that was in 1997 when I first started my first seeds. Um, within 2002 is when this building was built because my business, I mean, it was, I was so well embraced. I mean, it, I could instantly scale, you know, grow my business if I could just start more seeds, right? So that's when I moved into the cellar. We put grow lights down there. Um, and I was just growing a lot of seeds at this point in time. And it was all 100% soil blocking at that time. Um, and then once I got this building, we may created a designated grow room in the building. It's a 10 by 10 room. Um, the room, even though the room does have windows, the plants are grown based on the grow lights that are in there. And so it has some rolling racks with multiple shelves um, and grow lights on them. And also in that room is my table that has a seedling heat mat. And then um, I also have a germination chamber. A germination chamber is like the grown up version of a heat mat. When growers start growing so many seedlings, you can't possibly have enough heat mat. Um, and so I also have a germination chamber. We do also do use some plug trays when it's appropriate and the best fit for that seed and the volume that we need. Um, but yeah, it's evolved. And so probably about thinking about eight or 10 years in to start in the business, I realized that the seed starting portion of my business was key. I mean, if we didn't start them, we couldn't plan them. If we didn't plan them, we couldn't sell them. And what happens as you start flower farming? I mean, I just love watching people evolve through these stages in flower farming school, right? At first, you were paying so much attention to all these little minute details. And it's like, friend, when you start selling and you have to harvest and sell and deliver and keep weed free and plant and when you have all of your when you're juggling 28 balls instead of one ball in the beginning um, things get crazy so about eight or ten years in I can't quite remember I hired um, my niece Kelly who still she runs our a big part of our business now she was a, st a new stay-at-home mom and she wanted to work she knew nothing about, she's not a, she's still not a gardener really today. Um, she said, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just, you know, let me come to work one day a week. And so her job instantly became, she was the seed starter. That's all she did. She didn't come to work thinking, oh, we have to harvest first, then we'll seed start, or we have to do this or that. That was her primary job. And that was an enormous corner that we turned in our business. Sorry, long answer to a short yeah. question. No, that was great. So soil blocking played a really important role. Having a designated seed starter at some point played a really important role. Yep. That was very interesting to hear. Okay. So what is the most important skill for seed starters to develop? And this can be anything you want it to be. It can be a technique or it could be a general attitude. What do you think is the most important thing for seed starters to learn? To get the facts before you start. Um, I mean, does the seed get covered with soil or not? Does what temperature, you know, I mean, 
does it germinate best at? How long does it take to germinate? Um, because I, I would, I would be willing to say, Lane, so many of the questions that you're now getting that I used to field all the time by myself, it was basic information that oftentimes was written right on the seed package. And, but we get familiar. I mean, literally friends, and this is so true. When I'm planting cool flowers in the fall, I take the book out to the garden with me when I'm direct sowing. Does it get yeah. covered? I mean, my mind, it's like, it, what a major fail I could create. Like for instance, Buplurum, which is a huge crop for us. Um, if I covered it and it wasn't supposed to be covered it or vice versa. So I don't, don't rely on your memory. Don't do it from memory. Get the facts, create your own little database, flashcards, whatever you want. Um, but don't, because almost always Bobo and I say, Bobo will say, oh man, we had, Bobo is the seed starter now and has been for the last few years. She'll say, we had crummy germination on X. And I said, well, you know, it's probably temperature. I mean, you know, it's cool flower and it's still hot outside. Just start it again. And she'll like, you know what? You're right. I put it straight on the heat mat and it should have been up on a cookie cooling rack. So it's like our own fumblings really lead us to failures most often. So get the facts, even when you think you know them. For yes. sure. All right. Can you tell us about a seed that you struggled with in the past and have since figured out? So we all know not every attempt is going to be a success, especially at first when you're a new seed starter. So can you think of any seeds? Does anything come to mind that was a real struggle that you eventually learned how to grow? Sure. Um, for sure. And Ami Magus, which is a cool flower, it's like the Queen Anne's Lace lookalike for anyone that's not familiar. Um, Ami Magus was one that I just had mixed results for several years. You know, you'd get just enough to torture you to germinate. You know, I have a rule if it's 50% or less, we ditch that tray and do it over again because it's very torturous. And they would always be right on the line. And um, then one day, instead of ditching that tray, um, we, I just, I was busy. And I mean, when you're in, we, we have, we call it the seed starting freight train around here. <laughs> Once we start starting seeds, you know, there's seeds in the germination chamber, there's seeds on the heat mat. They, they have to go to the grow light and you have to bump the stuff out of the grow light onto the carport. You know, I mean, it's like this constant vicious circle, right? Well, this one particular day, I, I snatched that Ami Magus. It was just puny. I thought, I'm going to ditch your butt, but I can't do it right now. I'm just going to stick the tray over here um, on the ground in the grow room, which would be on cool concrete. And I pushed it under the shelf and I just kind of forgot about it. And, and I mean, I, I literally forgot about it. And then when I took the trays off of the shelf that were like three inches above it, it revealed the Ami Magus tray. And guess what? A hundred percent germination. Those boogers had just wow. been too warm. So our standard practice now for Ami and Dalkus um, is we sew them. We put them on the heat for about 24 hours. That just kind of alerts the seed that it's, you know, time to break dormancy. Um, and then we just put them on in a cooler area and they just pop like crazy. So, yeah, we're still figuring it out. How many years later? 25. It's just, yeah. It's funny how many times I wonder how many inventions have happened just by accident, like discovering them, just like you mentioned. And also that's a good example of it was something that you perceived as a failure at first, and then it ended up turning out to be a great exactly. success. Exactly. Good All point. Right. Next question. Okay. This is the question I gave to her ahead of time because I didn't think it was fair. Name five seeds you would not want to live without as a farmer. And I would also like to know which was the most significant crop for your farm. And this was a really hard question to answer because I'll tell you that, um, I mean, what flowers do I love? I love the flowers that sell, that sell week after week after week. And that's what I found with annuals um, that so often, I mean, I was looking for the staple flower that our, our commercial customers just could use every day of their business life, right? And so 
they, it, depending on the time of the year, it could change. But the five that jumped into my mind um, were Sweet William, Snapdragons, Xenias, Celosia Coxcomb, and of course, Sunflowers. Um, all five of those are just and there's so many others that could go along with it. They are sales all the time. You know, I mean, as I often say to people, you know, I just grow people say, well, what do you what are the special flowers you grow? I just grow what I can grow really well. That's a great cut flower. And I could sell it every week gone to all our customers because growing the flowers is only a small part of a flower farming business. It's finding customers, serving customers and selling to customers that finish the deal. And um, so it's kind of the whole package. So and the one I couldn't, what was, t- what exactly was the question? Which one of those annual crops was the most significant for your business? Well, I think it would be a miss to, to not say for sure, sunflowers, sunflowers. I <laughs> yeah. I mean, sunflowers, as I did for the first 10 years of my business, is the most underused, highly profitable, in demand when it's grown properly, sun, flower that there is. I mean, I can sell my sunflowers every week that we can have them. That's why we work so hard to see how early we can get them and how late we can have them so that I can start that freight train of send me 10 bunches every week, people. You know, that's what I want to hear from our customers or for bouquet making. I mean, Sunflowers paid for a $32,000 John Deere in one year. Um, You know, I mean, that's the reality. And you know, what, what did the cost of growing those sunflowers? A fraction of that. Yeah. yeah. So, and maybe you just gave the answer to this question in that answer, but can you name for us one underutilized cut flower grown from seed? So is there something that you think people should be growing more of or things, something that people don't grow that you think they should be? Well, I mean, I'm going to have to say sunflowers again, Lane. I mean, Dave Dowling and I talk all the time how people, especially, you know, because he sells bulbs and, you know, lots of these high um, dollar crops um, that are gorgeous. I have nothing against dahlias and ranunculus and anemones and all those things. And I say, you know what, after you're an established flower farmer with a long customer list, so you can sell them all and not eat any of them and you know what you're doing, go for it. But Dave and I oftentimes in our lives together will say people reach out to us all the time and say, how can I expand my business? If you're not planting a thousand sunflowers a week for as many possible weeks in a row as you can, and I recommend growing the same old one, Pro Cut Orange, um, that's the standard and that it's easier to just sell the same one over and over. And yes, people, the same people buy them over and over and over. Um, If you're not doing that, you know, that's like 12 wholesale. I mean, in a commercial world, that's $1,200 to $1,500 a week. You're not embracing. And I mean, how much easier? I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, (laughs) it's just a given. It's just a real given. It is. Okay. So we have gotten to the lightning round. So I'm afraid. (laughs) I mentioned before that this is going to be a series of rapid fire questions, Lisa. So you can just answer and give a little blurb about why that's your answer. And if you need to pause, I don't want you to be stressed out. If you need to pause, feel Uh, free to pause. Um, Are you ready? I am ready. I feel like I'm on jeopardy. You are, but you don't have to ring in. You're the the only contestant. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) All right. First lightning round question. And I'm not going to be putting slides up during this part because it's going to be moving so very fast. Uh, We hope. We hope. (laughs) We hope. Yeah. (laughs) So what is your favorite looking seed and your favorite looking seedling? And they don't need to be the same plant. Okay. My favorite seed seed is calendula, which is a pot marigold. Looks like a little seahorse almost. Yes. And um, my favorite seed lean, I'm going to have to go with Rudbeckia. I just love those fuzzy little leaves. They are. They're so cute. Okay, next. 
what is your favorite seed to sow and what is your least favorite? So is there something that you're just happy as you're sowing it and something that maybe you prefer not to? Sure. So I will again have to say sunflowers. I just love doing that. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of like quilting or cross stitching as you're doing it. It's a very satisfying thing. And the least favorite I think would be zinnias because we dump them in our hand and you put the pointy end down on the soil blocks. I'm really quick and efficient at doing it, but it's just a little bit more, a um, little bit more work to do. Yeah. It's just a little extra. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what is your favorite flower to harvest and what is your least favorite? Well, um, my least favorite used to be but I'll still classify it because it's a lot for a lot of people is Gumfrina. Um, but we have, I've kind of mastered that now because we have really ramped up our production of that. And I kind of, she, I used to, I said that Gumfrina and I got a divorce several years ago, but we're remarried now. So we're, we're coming along. Oh. Um, but it's not the flower that I dislike. It's the first cut of a crop sometimes that's really tough, but my favorite to cut is definitely coxcomb. All and right. Gumfrina would be my least favorite, I guess. Okay. Yeah. And I also should preface this by saying, anytime I'm asking you about your favorites, these are your favorites and least favorites today. Exactly. They may change, they may change 10 minutes from now. All right. So <laughs> which pest and which weed are the biggest troublemakers in your garden? Pests are the leaf-footed bugs, which is in the stink bug family. Um, they just seem to be really attracted to several crops that we grow and I just snatch them up and squish them in the blink of an eye. Um, what was the other question? Oh, weed, um, the least the yes. problem weed. Um, it's the grasses. I mean, the chickweed and henbit, we have a good handle on, but it's the grasses, several different varieties that are just, they just get so well rooted in and um, yeah, so grasses. Yes. I definitely agree with that. All right. This is a question I've been wondering about for a while. Uh -oh. If you were an annual, would you be a warm season tender annual or a cool season hardy annual? So do you not only survive, but thrive in cool weather or warm weather? Excellent question, Lane. <laughs> I am going to say I would definitely be a cool season hardy annual. I think. Oh, good. Sure. I think you'd be, sure. you'd be growing out in the garden with me then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good question. Uh, now this one, this, I maybe should have given this to you ahead of time. Cause I feel kind of bad springing this on a flower farmer, but if you were a flower, which one would you be and why? And I am going to need to ask you for a variety name and color if applicable. So what flower would I be? I mean, I definitely think probably a zinnia just because <laughs> they come and come and come and they just keep returning. They, you know, you cut them and they come back. And I think that's, I think of myself that way that, you know, I can fail or make an about turn. So yeah, I definitely think a zinnia. And if we want to talk colors, Yes. Um, undoubtedly my favorite, undoubtedly, and this is like Lane's already said, that's for right now. I changed my mind a lot. Yeah. Cor the Benary's giant coral is just my favorite this week. Okay, good. So now that was it for the lightning round, but now we are on to hypothetical situations. All right. Okay. So this is where you really do need your seatbelt, Lisa. Oh my. <laughs> okay. All right, y'all. So you are back in high production and you've just finished the biggest harvest of your life when a genie suddenly appears. The <laughs> genie says he can grant you the meal and dessert of your dreams. And I have to say that the genie can make anything. He can make restaurant food. He can replicate old family recipes. He is a very skilled genie chef. So I need to know what you ask him for in terms of a meal, dessert, and what you are drinking. 
This is so simple. Oh, good. It would be our family meal from my mother's house, rump roast, mashed potatoes, string beans, homemade Parker House rolls, <laughs> gravy. That's the meal. There's another vegetable, but I can't remember. And for dessert, she either made, and if it's somebody's birthday, she could have made both of these. She oh. made a chocolate pound cake that Ooh. was to die for. Oh, my goodness, is delicious. Or her quick go-to dessert was she would make chocolate pudding, not the instant kind, the kind you cook on your stove, and put a scoop of vanilla ice cream in a beautiful dish and then put chocolate pudding over top of it. I am oh, hungry wow. thinking about this. Yeah. Ooh, Good yeah. stuff. So that's the meal. That would be my homemade meal, you know, warm and fuzzy back from that was what we ate on Sunday e Sundays after church when I was growing up. And what would be your beverage of choice? For oh, sweet meal? tea. Sweet oh, tea. There you go. No there question. Go. Okay. Next question. I regret to inform you that in exchange for that dream meal, the genie is now going to turn you into an animal. He feels very bad that he forgot to mention that before, but it slipped his mind. So he, <laughs> he is going to turn you into the animal whose personality and character best matches your own. What animal is he going to turn you into? A lion. Oh. I know that because Stevie and I did a personality <laughs> class together. He's a golden retriever and I'm a lion. Oh, wow. And I think it suits me well. I mean, it does. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that I'm mean. It's just no. that I'm willing to, you know, flex my muscles when I need to. Right. Yes. All <laughs> right. So <laughs> having fun so far, Lisa. Yes. All right. So good news. The genie, as it turns out, is also a big practical joker. And he does not turn you into a lion. He just wanted to see your face when he told you that. <laughs> But you are not out of the woods yet. A group of aliens has decided they want to start flower farms on their home planet, but they don't know how to do it. So they have come to Earth to abduct you so that you can teach them how to farm. So it sounds bad, but when you actually think about it, it's kind of a compliment. <laughs> so you are allowed to take three tools with you. And these tools, to be clear, have to get you from seed to harvest. Which three tools do you take? And I will say I am happy to answer questions about other equipment or materials they may already have on the home planet. <laughs> All right. So they have to take a small soil blocker. That's what I of use 98% of, of the time, right? Small soil blocker. Undoubtedly you don't know what they're going to have available up there. We better take no. the garden hoe, my stand-up hoe that I love and use all yes. the time, especially if there's no mulch involved, right? Oh, yeah. And then the third thing, if we're going to farm and create a product to sell, cut flowers, you have to have shears. So there you go. And wouldn't you know, I predicted all three of those. Lisa. Did you I really? Yes, yes, I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> well, I okay. mean, I don't use a lot of tools and it's like, that, that'll yeah. do the trick. No, it, it really does. All right. So the aliens have returned you to earth and I'm happy to report their flower farms are profitable. So excellent job there. <laughs> <laughs> a movie producer <laughs> hears about your story and decides to make a biopic about Lisa Mason Ziegler, intergalactic flower farmer. Who should she cast to play you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Feel free to take a moment. That is a very, no, you know one. who I think. I was Ooh. just, I heard the theme song. This is, you probably won't even know who she is or what show I'm talking about. But I just heard the theme song yesterday. This is, a, this was a TV show back when I was, I was probably about five years away from becoming a flower farmer. But I just had, she, I always just had such great respect for her and thought, mm. and it is Dana Delaney. She played in oh, China yeah. Beach, yeah. and I love that song. I think it's the, um, 
I can't even remember who sings the song, but it's the Temptations or somebody like that. And um, I just, yeah, she could do it because, you know, you got to have some stay in power to be a daggone flower farmer because yeah, farming's you hard. To, you know, you're you fighting the be, weather. You know, you have to be a lion, a lion. There you just go. Like you. Okay. <laughs> Great question. <maybe. laughs> All right. This is the last hypothetical situation question. Oh my. Okay. Yes. Glenda the Good Witch casts a spell on all the florists in America, making them realize they should be using more locally grown flowers. And you know that once they go local, they won't go back, even once the spell wears off. So you are extremely excited and you want to send a text message to all your flower friends. But in your excitement, all you can think of to do is send your three favorite emojis of all time. They may or may not be related to flower farming at all, but we need to know what are the three emojis you would send. The emoji would be, I don't know what you call it, but it's the lady that's moving with her dance I dress knew, on. I knew it. The lady in the red dress that's like stomping. Yes. Yeah. Dancing. The sunflower yes. emoji. Yes. Right. Yes. And then the big smiley face emoji. I mean, <laughs> there you go. That's great. <laughs> That was great. Oh, that really Lane, that it. was great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to move on now. So we do have some more serious questions now that we've had a little fun. Just a few more. So what is the most rewarding part of being a flower farmer? You know, um, I think because I'm a little bit compulsive, you know, I mean, anybody that likes to cross stitch or do those types of repetitive tasks and get satisfaction out of it. For me, um, and as we've already said this once, this is true for me right now. It can all, it always changes. Oh, yeah. But one of my most rewarding parts of flower farming is either right at the end of the cool season planting season in the fall or very early spring most often in fall or the spring warm season at the end of the big first surge of planting and standing out and looking over all of these beds that are like little soldiers lined up right it's neat everybody's happy and to just think about that we started all that from seed is just pretty dadgum phenomenal for me I mean that's um, I mean, and then you can just pile on top of it, the reaction of people to the flowers. Um, I mean, I was always so surprised. I mean, I will tell you, probably every week for 24 years, um, well, not 24, we stopped selling commercially like two years ago. Um, every week, when it came time to send our list to our commercial customers, and then we follow up with a phone call immediately and say, hey, what do you want? And they get their list and tell us, and then we move on to the next one. Every week I have a little knot in my stomach thinking this is the week they're not going to buy. I always thought that our, you know, that they're, they're just our garden flowers, but friends, oh my gosh, when we pull into the parking lot with the delivery truck, they literally run out of their back door of their shops to see every, what everybody else is getting and what the flowers look like. And it is, it's not a proud moment, but it's like, oh yeah, this is it. This is why we're growing all these flowers. Yeah. You know? All right. This is a good one. How do you define success? I define success different today than I used to. Um, I mean, now that I've moved from being a production flower farmer, which back then it was the bottom line. You know, I wanted to make more money than I um, spent, which I did. I mean, that's part of you know, my whole recipe of being an annual grower, there's just such a bigger margin opportunity available. Um, but as I've evolved and become a teacher and we've created these tools to allow me to teach more, um, the success of having other people be successful, kind of following along in our, I mean, because I will tell you, I mean, it's, it's so simple that most people really miss it. You got to do the not fun stuff, get your business started and do all the mess you don't want to, you don't might not know how to do and it scares you, get it done and out of the way and then charge right in to um, really setting up and the, the notes, the social media posts, the stories, 
oh my goodness, of the success from people. That's what success is about, really seeing other people doing um, doing it and having success, which whatever their success is, you know, defined as. Um, so yeah. that's that's what success has become now. And, and working with other like-minded people like you. I mean, all of the success has allowed more of us to come together. I mean, we're becoming this bigger evolution of this machine that is doing more to help people. I mean, that's what's behind everything we do. I mean, we want to provide so much free resources, but there has to be some interchange of cash somewhere in there to make all that possible, right? And it's just all rolled together in one big delicious meatball. (laughs) I agree. And I think the Gardener's Workshop has become such a center of learning for people. And we have the nicest customers and students. And when people have a problem and reach out and we try to help them, they come back and they tell us, oh, this worked. Thank you so much. And that to me, that's also, I can understand why you said that's one of the greatest parts. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, if you're a, if you're a people pleaser, as many of us are, it's, it's great to be in a position to do it. (laughs) Yes. All right. Going back into the time machine, What advice would you give to your younger self when you were just embarking on your flower farming journey? Oh my goodness. This is so easy for me to not make it so complicated, to not try to reach beyond what I always felt like I had to have something new, bigger, better, and special for customers. Like each season, I would be digging in the catalogs and thinking, oh, I've got to have something for them to buy from me this coming season. And that, in fact, is not true. I sell the same flowers week after week after week. And those flowers naturally evolve going from cool season to warm season, maybe back to cool season or short day really high performers, like we're in the fall right now. I mean, Cosmos and Marigolds, and there's so many other great, and Eucalyptus, all of this, you know, there's always something. And, but I just, for years, and I'll tell you this very short story. So back when we were just starting what was called our members only market, um, you know, ladies would come here, people that bought shares would come here to pick up their share and they could spend, you know, it's like a gift card. You spend as much as you want. And that's back when I was knee deep and growing tons of lilies, lilies that were, I mean, shipped here every week. They had to be planted in crates and, you know, kept free from deer. And then we'd cut them and they'd be unplanted, very involved. And I could sell all the lilies, don't get me wrong, but this is how the light bulb finally went on for me. So we would have our members only market. If you're watching on YouTube, it'd be very much like what you see behind me, this harvest that's sitting here. Ladies would come in this door and all they would see is all these buckets. I would say, hey, come over here and look at this XYZ lily that, you know, because we would be sure to have a few open so they would see what they were going to look like. Aren't they just beautiful? They say, oh. Those are just lovely. I'll take two dozen zinnias, please, every week. I mean, what I learned was those things that I felt like were just simple garden flowers were, in fact, what people were hungry for, that they wanted week after week after week. And it took me a long time to figure it out. And so for the last 12 years, that's what we've grown. Those annuals that are low investment, high return, in demand. You don't croak when a deer eats a bed clean. It's like you're upset, obviously. It didn't happen very often. But when it did, it wasn't like, oh, my gosh, that was this $3,000 worth of bulbs, which happened to me. Bulls ate an entire bed of bulbs once. And it was like as a new grower, that was a big chunk of money that I was out. And there was no returning from that. Um, So simplify, simplify. I say that. I bet so often in flower farming school, stop making it so hard, y'all. Stop making it so hard. All right. So we are to the final question of this episode. So after everything we've talked about, Lisa, would you agree that seeds have in fact changed your life? And if so, I'm going to need you to give me a complete sentence explaining how, starting with seeds changed my life. Seeds did change my life um, by 
figuring out how to start them and being a part of that whole miraculous process. I mean, that's why I'm convinced that people start way too many tomato plants. You know, so many people start tomato seeds that don't normally start seeds, right? I mean, everybody wants a tomato plant, but instead of starting the five that they need, they start 25. And it's being, it's that whole process of being a part of that miracle of, you know, it's kind of like having your own little grandbaby, you know, and you, you get to nurture it and take care of it. And I mean, I see the looks on people's face when they tell me they're having this problem with their seedling. I say, well, just compost that one and start over. It's like compost my grandkid. Are you kidding me? (laughs) I mean, it's true, but seeds have changed my life. Um, Undoubtedly, it's the number one um, subject that I talk about. It was the number one lecture that when I was traveling all over kingdom come that the most requested um, and the most questions, the most struggles. And so conquering it um, has definitely launched and led my business and my teaching. I mean, that's where I really got started teaching was teaching other people how to start seeds simply in a small space when you don't have a greenhouse like I don't. Yep. All right. So we have learned today, everyone, that seeds have in fact changed Lisa Mason Ziegler's life. So I have a few things, a few requests for anyone who's watching over on YouTube. First of all, give us a thumbs up, like this video. If you enjoyed this interview, I would like to know what is your favorite question from this interview or what was your favorite round of questions? So leave a comment saying that we would also like to know who you would like to see us do this style of interview on. So leave us some suggestions in the comments. And also feel free to answer some of the questions, especially from the lightning round or the hypothetical round. Answer some of these questions. We'd love to see what you have to say. And I'm going to say that our next episode of Seed Talk is not going to be next Thursday, but the Thursday after that, we're going to try to do an every other week schedule. And that is going to be all about cool flowers overwintering. So that should be, yes, yes, that should be a good one. Yes. So I'm going to turn it over to Lisa now to talk a little bit more about her school course, which is all about growing annual crops. So take it away, Lisa. Thank you, Lane. Um, Thank you for those questions. That was really fun and um, (laughs) very unexpected. Um, So it is we're recording this in September and this is um, October. November is a big time when our online courses, the big schools enroll. They only do that once a year for a very short period of time because the courses are six weeks long. They're only offered once a year. And so my course happens to launch um, this year, the first of October through the fifth. And, um, you know, it is really the simplistic methodology that I follow um, of how to become a professional, how to start your business, bootstrapped friends, no debt. You do not have to debt. If you can't scrape together a thousand bucks, then you need to get a side hustle now to get ready to get what you need um, because it's not going to be a lot. And um, so Flower Farming School Online, the basics, annual crops, marketing, and more um, is just packed. And I will say that the new tool that is a part of my course, Lane actually is the builder of that um, tool, and it's called the Cool Flowers Field Report. Is that right, Lane? Yeah, Field Growers Report. Field Growers Report. And it is an interactive tool where you can enter in your experience with different cool season hardy annuals, you know, by putting in your zone, what you did, was it successful or not. It immediately populates this document. Then you can go in and also view the document and search like for things in your zone or about specific flowers. It is incredible, y'all. There is nothing else out there like it. And we're really trying to create that information that has been missing from the farming and the gardening world, even for all of these years. Um, And so that's part of the course. And so the course is six weeks long. um, And if you're not familiar with our online school or any of our online courses, once you purchase it, it is yours forever. You have, as long as you have internet and you can log in, you have access to your online courses. You go into your library and it's all right there. And 
Um, there it's there's just tons of content. We do a live Q and A, which Lane and Jesse, um, y'all submit your questions. Um, Lane makes the slideshow. Jesse organizes them so we can then have a time together each week during school to answer all those, as well as we have a closed Facebook group during school. But the best part for our students, so they say, is that we even after school is over have a alumni Facebook group where you continue to have access to me and to other serious growers. Because What's so great about joining a community of people that are serious about building their businesses is how supportive and how helpful they are. I mean, there's no judgment. There's, um, I mean, people just, once you realize how complicated we have made this and how uncomplicated it can be, and you get down to the business of growing and selling flowers and learning how to sell. And um, anyway, so I invite you to go over to the gardenersworkshop.com, go to my online course page. There's information there. You can sign up to get on the wait list um, and we will send you links and not let you miss it. Um, and I'm just stoked. I just, I love when y'all, that's really my passion is teaching. And this tool allows us to really help a lot of people all over the world, actually. Yes. Yep. It's great. So thank you, um, Lane, for this interview. I loved being your guest today. And, thank um, you. Did you have so, fun? I did, did have fun. fun. I oh, did good. have fun. Good. And um, so friends, until we meet again, Head on over to thegardenersworkshop.com and check out all of our um, resources, courses, and our online garden shop, and um, you will find a lot of fun over there. All right, friends. Ciao. Bye.